we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for attending today's Friday Financial webinar. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so if you do miss any part of it or you need to re-watch any part of it, it will be posted on our website at events.bbbcommunity.org. Um, my name is Faustine Chan. I'm the Business Innovation Manager for BBB Serving Pacific Southwest. So we've been hosting these webinars for our businesses and also the business community on a wide variety of topics just to help you um, during this time, just to give you resources and tools um, just to help you with your business. Um, if you do have any questions during this um, webinar, please make sure um, you just type them in the chat option and the Q&A option, and we will go ahead and answer those accordingly as well. Um, I want to introduce today's speaker, Jen Dimmick. Um, she is a graduate of Cumberland University, summa cum laude, with her master's degree in business administration. She has spent the last 15 years leveraging technology to create efficient accounting processes and to easy understand actionable financial information that has led to millions in profits and measurable community impact. Outside of work, she spends her time with her husband, Norman, and her fur babies. I want to know what the fur babies are. <laughs> Ella and Lucy. Um, she also enjoys treasure hunting, motorcycle rides, and geeking out on the latest tech and searching for the best mountain views. So please welcome Jen. I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you for all who are attending today. Um, I'm very honored to uh, have been asked to do this presentation. Um, my fur babies are Ella and Lucy, and they are Yorkie mixes. Ella is a Schnauzer, miniature Schnauzer Yorkie mix. Lucy is a miniature uh, a Yorkie and Maltese mix. And so we kind of have ebony and ivory thing going on in our household. Uh, they are adorable, and hopefully you won't hear them in the background, but I'm not making any promises, um, such as the life today, right? So I am going to share my screen with you uh, today so we can just hop right into the presentation. Today we're talking about uh, building a stronger business outside uh, this crisis and during this crisis, and I'm calling it the COVID-19 MBA. Uh, often we have our best lessons learned uh, during times of struggle. So we're going to give you some bits of advice today. Uh, this is our lovely team at Four Leaf. Uh, Jill Foley and I are the two partners in the firm. And then we have our other lovely ladies uh, that help with our accounting and uh, overall business management. So if you see us in the community, be sure to say hi. Uh, we want to meet all of you at some point. So today we're going to talk about uh, four major points. We're going to talk about how we got here. Uh, a lot of people are talking about how this is unprecedented times and we never saw this coming. And, you know, from a health standpoint, I agree. Uh, you know, we've talked about the flu before, but, but I don't think anyone could have fathomed the, the pandemic that is uh, the coronavirus. But from an economic standpoint, I don't agree. I think we could have seen this coming. Uh, at least to a degree. And then we're going to kind of do an after action review, right? We're still in the thick of it a bit, but we're going to talk about lessons we've learned so far, how we can take those lessons and move forward to be not just different, but better on the other side of this. So a little bit about how we got here. Um, you know, markets run in cycles, and I want to let you guys know that I am coming at this as a small business owner myself. Uh, you saw my team, we have a small team. Uh, and while we are accountants, we are small business owners, we're in it just like you guys are. And so I, I found a few things uh, interesting, Isaac Newton, what goes up must come down. So again, while uh, the health crisis is unprecedented, perhaps the, econ the economy is not. Um, failing to plan is planning to fail. That is my favorite quote from Ben Franklin. And then uh, a more recent one concerning our, our current situation from um, Mark Zandi over at Moody Analytics, one of my favorite economic blogs, if you get a chance to check it out, is that recessions come when optimism reaches its peak. So, you know, we've been looking for that peak for a while now. And we've been probably in the, in the longest ex economic expansion that, we've, that any of us have seen. Uh, in, in our lifetimes, we had tremendous consumer spending. We had a lot of customers 
it required a lot of inventory uh, from those of us that do products and, and bigger teams for those of us who deliver services. And all of that requires capital. All of it requires uh, an investment into our, our companies and typically in the form of cash of some sort. And then, you know, on the flip side of that are more customers, um, more spending. A lot of times customers are requiring more credit. Even sometimes that's how we're differentiating our products from our competitors. Uh, we see a lot of these, uh, you know, one year, no interest, no payments, or, um, you know, a, a, these money back guarantees kind of things. And so all of these are, are forms of credit. And then we also saw some of the lowest unemployment rates we've ever seen. I don't know if you guys have tried to hire prior to COVID, but we did, and we had a struggle. We have an amazing benefits package, uh, and, we, and we pay very well. But at the, at the same time, the market was so tight, and there was so much competition for uh, workers that it was driving up wages. So all of this, again, is, is pulling at the capital that we may have had inside of our businesses. So while we love the good times, right? We love when the economy is good. Um, we can fall into some complacency a little bit. Uh, so we have this sense of um, everything is going to be good and it's always going to be good. And so we become too optimistic to create a reserve. We don't think we're going to need that or we want to make sure our money is working for us and not just sitting aside. Uh, in good times, low interest rates are typically found. And so uh, it makes going into debt attractive because the interest rates are so low, sometimes even zero. How many of you have had a 0% a credit card for a year or more, sometimes 18 months? And so that makes it attractive to, to go ahead and, and take the plunge and go into debt in order to make an investment in your business. And then there's no pressure to create any kind of business continuity plan. So we think things are good and that they're always gonna be good. And so we don't have this sense of urgency to make sure that we're prepared for when things aren't so good. So like Isaac Newton said, what goes up must come down and could we have seen this coming? Well, there was a Forbes article back in June of 2019 that was talking about when is the end of the expansion coming? We were overdue for a recession. And the Fed predicted that there was a 64% probability of a recession within 12 months of that article. So here we are 10 months later. Now, was this artificially induced? The timing of it was artificially induced, yes. But the recession was looming and we could have been, uh, if we had been more prudent, if we hadn't been blinded by the, the good times, you know, many of us could have been in a better position today if we had planned for the recession to come. So what are some things that we can take away? What are some lessons that we can learn or have already learned in this crisis? And it's really important for us to take the time to sit and think about how things are different and how things um, are going to, how we're going to operate differently in the future. Uh, I'll give you an example. So uh, in 2009, I became really sick and I uh, was uh, since diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. But in 2009, I was on top of the world and I was in corporate America. I was the youngest CFO uh, uh, of the time in, in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, where I'm from. And I suddenly couldn't work anymore. And I couldn't work for two years. I was bedridden uh, for a lot of that. And so I had to think, okay, when I come out of this, because I will, what, what is my life going to look like? What is my work going to look like? And that is when I started putting in place things, uh, a remote a work plan, a, a, a business that uh, fed me, you know, spiritually and, and, and emotionally, as well as uh, made money for my family. And so all of these things came about because I went through a personal crisis. So what are some things that we 
have learned through this uh, business crisis that we're that we're all facing today. And I think the first one is that technology is empowering, and many of us have thought that um, you know remote work wasn't possible, or we've had team members asked to be able to work from home and we're like, no, 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 you know, I can't see you. I can't, I can't manage that, um, those kinds of things, or, or we don't have a way for you to work from home. When in reality, we did all along. What we have found is that technology is inexpensive and ubiquitous. It is everywhere and it is cheap. And the tools that we're now using, things like Microsoft Teams or Zoom, things like Slack, or other uh, messaging kind of communication tools uh, are, are tried and tested. And it's just many of us have not taken the plunge before. So it has really enabled us to do work differently and even new kinds of work. The next one is that we need to make a plan before we need a plan. And when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about specifically business continuity. And you know we need to plan, we need to put some of those plans into practice so that we can test them to see where we're missing the ball. Um, then we need to tweak the plan and we just need to repeat this. And we need to do this while times are good. We need to do this while it's not needed so that when the time comes like it did, we have it to fall back on. Uh, the next one, and I, I, I'm gonna hammer this home a little bit, so forgive me if you get tired of hearing it, but cash is king. Uh, we kind of have a, a saying within the firm that three to six months of operating capital will get you through a crisis. A short-lived crisis, three to six months will get you through that. However, 12 months will help you weather a storm. And we don't know if a storm is gonna come from out of this crisis. We don't know if this recession is gonna be long-lived or not. Um, we have people talking on, on both ends of the spectrum that you know all of the the influx of government spending is going to take us you know into a recession even longer because we're going to have to figure out how to pay for it um, other people say nope we're good once this thing is done and we're all back to work then the economy just kicks back up from where it left off uh, i land in the middle somewhere so uh regardless if you had the cash reserves to weather this storm um or this crisis then you know, this would be a very different uh, type of thing right now. The last point that I feel like we've learned so far is that we need to be creative. Flexibility inside your operations, flexibility in your thinking, flexibility in your delivery methods, flexibility in your supply chain. It creates opportunity that you're going to need so that you can pivot and respond to the changing needs of uh, this particular this particular crisis or any any crisis you get a chance to kind of meet customers where they are and then leverage the talents inside your team talents you may not have known they had talents that they may have been itching uh, to employ inside your organization and, and just haven't had an avenue for doing that so uh, keeping an open mind being flexible being creative so we're going to dive into each of these a little bit more uh, and talk about how we're going to move forward in, in, in implementing some of these lessons that we've learned. So we want to come out stronger than we went in and more prepared for the next crisis that inevitably will come. I never want to hear again, we didn't see this coming. Uh, there was no way we could have predicted this. Well, you know, the individual crises, no. But the fact that they're going to happen, sure, we, we all need to prepare for that to happen. So the four things I want to talk about are how to monitor your working capital, ways to monitor the efficiency inside your organization, um, how communication has changed and how it can continue to change, and then again, being able to pivot to respond to the changing uh, needs of your customers and the changing environment that you're working in. So first is working capital. Now this is Financial Friday. I'm an accountant, so I would be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, financial measures uh, a little bit. So I think there are three basic financial measures that you need to have your thumb on the pulse of in your business at all times. 
And this will help you determine how much of that working capital you have to meet those three, six, 12 month kind of thresholds. The first for those that are uh, physical product type businesses, you have inventory turns. And what this is measuring is how much of your capital is tied up in inventory at any one point in time. So it looks at the cost of goods sold, so the cost of the inventory that you sold during a time frame, and then the average inventory that you kept during that time frame. And what it tells you is, let's, let's just take a quarter for instance. Uh, so in a three month time, let's say that you were able to turn over your inventory three times. So that's telling you that you, the entire sum of the inventory that you have on hand is sold and replenished three times within a quarter. So essentially monthly. A high inventory turnover, a lot of people think is really good. That means that uh, you don't have a ton of capital setting on the shelf at any one time, that your sales team is doing what they need to do and they're out there selling. But in reality, it's a little nuanced because uh, if your inventory turns are really, really high, you have to ask yourself, are we able to produce enough to meet market demands? Is the market demanding more of us than we've been able to produce or uh, keep in our inventory to sell? And so if that's the case, you may be missing out on sales. If it's really low, so if your inventory turns are you know, one or two or whatever the case may be in the time period that you're looking at, then the likelihood that you've got stale inventory on the shelf is really high. Um, you've also got carrying costs, right? You've got capital tied up in the cost of the product. You've got storage costs. You've got energy costs. Uh, all of that related to that inventory just kind of sitting there. Besides the fact that you don't have the cash coming in from the sales. So with any of these numbers that we're talking about, any of these metrics or key performance indicators, KPIs, sometimes they're called, I want you to understand that there's a couple of different benchmarks that you need to look at. One is a benchmark for your industry, and you should be able to research and, and uh, industry publications and things like that to find out what is the inventory turn benchmark for your industry. Uh, some industries, it's really high. I'm thinking grocery stores, things like that, that tends to be higher. Some inter industries may be lower. And if you're a, a, a car sales uh, industry or uh, some of these other appliances or something like that, a bigger ticket item, sometimes that might be lower uh, inventory turns. But so that's benchmark number one. But benchmark number two, I feel like is more important than any of them. And that's yourself. You want to be better today than you were yesterday. So benchmarking against yourself to make sure that you're always growing and you're always changing, to me is the most important benchmark with the industry kind of in the background saying, okay, I know what my competitors, if you will, are doing or what's expected inside the industry. But if I'm going to be different, then this, this is you know, me measuring against myself. So that's inventory turnover. The second one is accounts receivable turnover. And these are based on credit sales. These are not credit card sales. These are uh, company credit that you're extending to your customers. And how long does it take you to collect that credit uh, once you've made the product sale? So this looks at credit sales, net of any kind of returns or refunds compared to your average accounts receivable balance uh, for the time period. And so when you're looking at this, again, industry benchmarks, personal benchmarks uh, are important, but this allows you to kind of forecast your cash flow. If you know that you have $10,000 of credit sales out there and it takes you 45 days to collect, then you know that the credit sale that you make today won't turn into cash for another 45 days. So you can use that to project your cash flow um, as we're working through this. And then the last one is days cash on hand. And you know, this is an important measure 
but it's, it was an often a throwaway measure until this crisis happened. So days cash on hand measures how much liquid cash do I have right now sitting in the bank versus what are my average daily expenses um, that come through for any purpose. And so once you kind of get that calculation, let's just assume it's 20, say I have 20 days of cash on hand. What that's saying is I have 20 days of operating capital in my bank if I do not get in another single dollar of revenue. And the reason why this was often a throwaway metric is because people were like, there's not going to be a day when I'm not going to have a, at least a dollar of revenue coming in. I mean, I have people paying on credits, uh, you know, credit accounts. I have uh, salespeople out there making product sales. So there's never going to be a day when I'm not going to have a single dollar coming in. And then coronavirus hit. And I am certain that there have been companies out there that now have no dollars coming in the door uh, one day to the next. And so this particular metric is important to keep your eye on. This is important too to kind of start measuring against those three month, six month, 12 month thresholds. So if your goal is to have 90 days of cash on hand and you have 20, then you need to start making some decisions on uh, what can I do from an expenditure standpoint? What can I do from a credit collection standpoint to get that, uh, that number up to the threshold that we were talking about? And, you know, guys, there's a lot of math formulas. There's a lot of things going on here with these metrics that I'm talking about. We have already developed a free Excel template for you to use that you can plug in the numbers um, and it will create this little dashboard for you to look at. So that'll be on our website. I'll point you to that at the end. Uh, so don't get crazy about trying to figure out what the math is behind some of these. So the next piece of it is uh, efficiency. So we want to be efficient in our operations. And there's a couple of different ones that we look at. The first one is not a technical term at all. Uh, you won't find this in any accounting textbook. but It's something that I call labor load. And for those of us that are in the service business, this is especially important because we don't necessarily have inventory turns. So what this is looking at is fully loaded labor, wages, taxes and benefits, compared to revenue that came in. So again, you can change the time period that you're looking at. Um, you can make it a rolling time period if you want. And again, these are their benchmarks, industry benchmarks out there for you as well to look at. But for a service business like mine, 85% uh, labor load is not unheard of. And you know what that's telling me is that 85% of the money that I spend on my employees is generating revenue is 85% of my revenue. For every dollar that comes in, 85 cents is spent on my staff. Um, so, you know, this is an important metric to, to look at when we're looking at uh, efficiency measures and cash, uh, you know, whether or not we have the capacity to add on additional, um, additional staff people or additional clients to, to kind of work through. So we need to pay attention to this. The next efficiency measure is our conversion rates. And there's a couple of different ones to look at. One is marketing and one is sales, and they kind of go hand in hand. So the marketing conversion rate is, you know, let's just use a website, for instance. How many clicks on my website turned into qualified leads? How many um, clicks on my Facebook ad turned into qualified leads, or uh, how many times did a phone call to customer service turn into a sale even. Um, and then sales are looking at how many times did those leads turn into a sale. So this is talking about, you know, uh, a return on investment on your marketing efforts, the efficiency of your sales team, and again, where investments can be made uh, most prudently. Now, even though this is 
a financial webinar, if you will, I would, I would not be doing any of us justice if I did not talk about communication. And I don't know how many of you got or sent, probably even sent them uh, these, we are open for business for COVID-19, or this is how we're responding to COVID-19. And I've heard from a lot of people that they got weary of them. I did not. I did not get weary of them. I wanted to see the people I was doing business with, what they were doing to respond. But I also looked at it from, okay, this is what they're doing. What can I do uh, in my business, like what they're doing in theirs? And so communication can really build a business and it can really destroy a business. Both lack of communication and bad communication can destroy a business. But one of the lessons that we've learned during this crisis is that there are multiple channels for us to leverage to communicate. There is email, there is uh, videos now. Um, we're talking about social media even more to get our message out there. And we're having a different kind of connection and we're having a different kind of conversation. Um, I feel like even though they're not in person, that a lot of these conversations are even more intimate. We are getting to connect one-on-one -on -one with our customers and they now have the time to respond to those questions. So, you know, on social media, we could be talking about um, different ways they're using our products uh, during this time or you know, we're talking to our staff about how they're feeling and how they're coping um, with all this that's going on via video. So it's really different uh, now, and I hope that we will continue these conversations in all of these channels as we move through this crisis. So lastly is pivoting, and uh, it was really kind of ironic because my partner and I, Jill, we kind of declare a word for the year and we had already decided back in December of 19 that 2020 was going to be the year of pivot. And we had declared that because it had served us so well in 2019 that we were going to be very intentional about it in 2020. And then, you know, everything hit the fan. So uh, pivoting to respond to changing needs is going to be so important for your business from now on. We're going to need different methods for delivering services and working internally. So, you know, the virtual meetings, um, cleaner spaces. How many of you have uh, just changed, completely changed the way that you're cleaning your space? New packaging. I got a takeout meal uh, Tuesday of this week that was packaged in such a way that to let me know that it had not been touched by the driver that that brought it um there are new seals on things there are new uh packaging materials now that are are supposed to be safer so new ways of connecting we talked about that just a second ago um, new ways of connecting with our customers new ways of connecting with our team now that we're talking also about different channels many of us have had to diversify our supply chains for those of us that that you know typically bought things from uh, China, everybody did. This is the way of the world. Um, we've had to, to find different ways of getting products. So, you know, many have brought it back domestically. Some have looked at South America or other uh, less affected areas. We've had to come up with new uses and new customers for the products that we are currently producing or new distribution channels. I mean, there are restaurants doing deliveries now that had never done deliveries before. Uh, so just new ways of getting product out there. We uh, personally, we are doing uh, digital products that we have never done before. So it's really an interesting time to leverage those new channels. Uh, talent, we don't want to ignore the, the, the team members and the talent that they have. Um, we're leveraging employee talents in new ways. Uh, for instance, I love public speaking and my partner does not. So we are leveraging that talent of mine to deliver some of these new products and services that we had not done before. 
uh, identifying talent gaps. You know, so many of us are using technology in ways we've not before. And you may be finding that you don't have the, the technology knowledge and capability on your team that perhaps you need. Uh, and then creating some creative employee benefits. How many on the call may extend this remote work from home benefit to your employees where you had not done that before? And, and how many of you see that as a benefit um, to not only your bottom line, so you may be reducing space cost, but also the, the uh, reducing turnover uh, and, and leveraging your employees in ways you had never done before. So these all really speak to our bottom line. Lastly, I wanna talk about our, the products and services that we've created and how to pivot those. It's been really interesting to see how many new products using the same materials have come out of this. And I'll give you an example. And this actually is an example also of um, creating new products to meet the changing needs of uh, our customer bases. So I had virtual happy hour with a dear friend of mine last night. And she mentioned that a local uh, brewery was selling boxes of staple groceries. I thought, well, that's really interesting. I wonder why they would do that. And then it dawned on me that they are likely setting on an inventory of raw materials, eggs, flour, sugar, and they have distributors that distribute to restaurants that don't necessarily distribute to grocery stores. So they saw the need in the community uh, of, of a low inventory level at grocery stores of these staple goods and a need for them to get rid of it because it's sitting on their shelves spoiling. So what they did was they put together these staple boxes that you could order from them and go and pick up. That is brilliant. They have a revenue stream, they are getting rid of inventory, they are meeting a need inside the community, and it's not something they would have done otherwise. And they may not continue to do that afterwards, but just the, the thought process behind using the products that you have, materials that you have now to deliver new products to meet a community need. Uh, new products to meet changing needs. I mean, we've heard of, uh, the car manufacturers now manufacturing ventilators. So is that something they'll continue in the future? Who knows? Uh, definitely not at the level that we're doing it now, but they are leveraging their existing production line and talent pool to produce something new to meet a need that exists right now in the market. So keeping that mindset of always being able to pivot um, your current operations to meet a changing need uh, in the community. So how are we all going to put all of this together to come out of this to be not just different, because we all, I think, agree that, that we're never going to be the same, but not just different, but better. And again, I have four points here. First one is liquidity. Um, in order to be better, we need to make sure that we have a reserve to tap in the next downturn of the market. Monitoring the health of your business. Again, I have built this dashboard for you guys that you can download from our website. And they have real actionable measures. These are not just something you're gonna look at and then put aside. These are things that you can actually make changing decisions to make these measures um, move in positive ways. The next is flexibility. So making sure that you continue to have this flexible work environment and product delivery uh, so that when things happen, you're not so rigid that you can't respond. And the last one, but the most important in my mind is planning. Having a tested plan for business continuity in future crisis. Again, we have a business continuity uh, template for you on our website that walks you through all the questions you need to ask yourself, and then um, a place where you can, can kind of write down the pieces of the plan that relate to your business, and you can distribute this among your team. And all of this is free on our website. So liquidity, monitoring, flexibility, and planning, 
these are the ways that we're going to come out of this crisis better than we were before. Uh, another quote from Ben Franklin that I thought was uh, apropos is that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. You know, we can invest in a lot of different things, but you taking the time to invest in yourself and your business by attending these webinars that the BBB has put out, um, giving your, your employees the opportunity to invest in continuing education for their own uh, benefit and, and health of your business during this time is, is gonna pay off dividends uh, way beyond in the future. So if you'd like to get in touch with us uh, after this webinar, here is our, our pertinent information, um, our phone number and my email address there. And then um, also, if you'd like to check out the resources that I mentioned uh, on our website, our website is fourleafaccounting.com. You will see at the top uh, a link for resources, a link for remote work where we uh, have created videos and templates for that. We are a 100% remote team and we have been. Um, I started my business back in 2012 and uh, merged with Four Leaf in 2019 and we have been 100% remote all of the time. And all of this has broken down uh, geography barriers. We have team members spread out across the valley. It has uh, broken down barriers for servicing customers. We have customers in several states. And you know, it's, it's really one of the things that we feel like we've done really well. And we want to share our lessons learned um, with you guys so that you can uh, take from what we have done and, and turn it into a value for yourselves. So again, fourleafaccounting.com, uh, links at the top for resources and remote work. Okay, well, that is my presentation for today, and we are open for questions. Thank you, Jen. That was really great information. I hope everybody found that information useful. Um, we'll definitely check out those resources on your website. So um, thank you for sharing those. Um, we do have a question from Rosa. Um, she asks, if I moved an employee to another position to fill in a gap to leverage my resources, should I move them back to their original position immediately after this crisis is over? You know, that's a really interesting question. And um, I really think it, it plays into that particular employee's desires and, and talent. So if you find that this employee has a real talent for this position that you've moved them into, then perhaps you would choose not to move them back. If this is something that this particular employee is doing just to kind of help out and would prefer the, the job he or she had before, then you want to be flexible and, and give that employee an opportunity uh, to do the kind of work that is meaningful to them. Great, thank you. Um, someone wrote, you mentioned your team has always been remote. What prompted you to do so and keep Four Leaf Accounting fully remote? With their business being financial accounting prior to COVID, how or where would you meet this with, how would you meet with clients? Sure. So what prompted um, us to be 100% remote uh, in the beginning was my diagnosis. So with a multiple sclerosis diagnosis, there were times when um, I couldn't travel to meet with clients and uh, was uncomfortable, you know, clients coming into my space because I may have been, um, you know, needing to be in a wheelchair or needing to be uh, even in bed at that day, but it didn't mean I couldn't work. So that's what prompted it. The reason why we've continued to do it is from a lifestyle standpoint. And uh, my partner, Jill, loves to travel. So we've set it up to where she can work from wherever she lands. She's gone to Paris. She uh, had plans to go to Italy uh, this year. That's obviously not happening. But uh, she loves to travel. And so we wanted to make sure that she could have the lifestyle that she wanted and still be able to work. We also have employees with large families. And it's important for them to have the flexibility in their schedules uh, to meet the demands of their families and still provide service. And so we, what we found is that it's worked amazingly well. We have always met with clients via video. Um, before COVID-19, 
Uh, we still, we did go on site from time to time, but we didn't um, have a no on site policy. Uh, we did it when it made sense but it wasn't something that we did every day and we don't typically have clients coming uh, into our office. So we have set it up to where from the beginning, we set the expectation with our clients that we will uh, meet with them via video and we share uh, files and information uh, from a cloud of uh, a secure cloud uh, portal for our clients. And so it works really, really well for us. Great, thank you. So we have a question from John, actually a couple of questions in his chat option here. Um, as a small business owner, I've never thought about remote working until this crisis. Do you think more companies will become remote um, and stay remote because of this crisis? Do you think it's cost effective as a company and do you think it affects company culture? You know, I'll, I'll answer the culture one first. Um, company culture, takes intentionality. And so I feel like that we have an amazing co company culture at Four Leaf. And again, but it, it comes with a lot of intentionality, a lot of communication, a lot of um, just working together, even even via video uh, chat features, things like that to keep our, our, our employees connected is a, is a very big deal for us. We do all the things that typical companies do. We have water cooler kind of conversations through chat. Um, we talk about our personal lives. Uh, we have virtual happy hours. We do um, things like we have a wellness challenge. I don't know if you can see behind me or not, but we put a wellness challenge in place for this last quarter and we're tracking that. So, uh, you know, it's really, really interesting about culture and it, it all just takes some intentionality. Um, do I think companies will continue to do this? I hope so. To me, it is less expensive to pay for the you know, document storage and the video chat pieces than it is to pay for rent. And so it, it may depend on the team. Um, it definitely is gonna depend on family size and, and the home dynamic. But I hope companies will always give the option to employees um, to have that flexibility to work at home, if not all the time, uh, at least when it makes the most sense. Great, now we have a um, question from Kimberly. Um, any tips you would suggest for teams to keep their financials in order, especially submitting receipts and remotely to our finance team? That's coming from a nonprofit organization specifically. Uh, thank you, Kimberly, for that wonderful question. Uh, this is something that we feel like we excel at. We have our own internal processes for our clients, um, and our clients are mostly nonprofit organizations and then businesses, small businesses that have a community focus mission um, at their core. And there are lots of applications out there for you. If you're a QuickBooks online user, there's actually a, a feature inside QuickBooks Online where you can snap a photo of your receipt and code it. You can even do it from your phone. Um, there are other applications. We use something called HubDoc internally. Um, we layer it with other software pieces um, that's kind of unique to us, but HubDoc allows you to do the same thing. Um, it's kind of like Receipt Bank um, or the NEAT system that, that has been used in the past where you can just snap a photo of your receipt uh, and it stores it in a cloud-based system that your finance uh, folks can, can access. Um, the most important thing is that we are keeping in communication that um, you find ways to, to get information sent in. And again, leveraging technology is gonna make that even easier. Great, so um, we have a question on what size businesses does Four Leaf work with and who is your ideal customer? Wow, thank you so much for that question. Uh, the size businesses that we work with kind of range from uh, about, you know, 500,000 to 350 to $500,000 on the low end. Um, 
and on the high end, you know, we have a $40 million customer. So our ideal client though, is less about size and more about fit. So our ideal customer are small businesses that have a community focus, um, whether they are uh, providing a needed service, almost like a social enterprise inside the community um, or nonprofit organizations. And they have great communication. They, they may not be the most technically savvy, but they are open um, to, to those kinds of opportunities. They're passionate about what they do. Um, they have a great culture inside their own organization that you know, we can easily plug into. So again, our ideal client um, is less about size and more about values. We want them to make sure that they value our services as being advisors um, and being uh, partners with them kind of on their leadership team as we're working through finances. Great, thank you. Um, a question comes from Penny. Um, if I'm considering to do this with my business, um, what is the best way you have found to communicate what you offer to the public in order to get clients and keep clients? Uh, I'm, I'm unclear about what this is, if, uh, but if you're just talking in general about you know, how to get your message out there in this kind of environment, social media is the best. Uh, making sure that you have a website people can go to, leveraging video, even short ones, to introduce yourself, to introduce your services, um, is, the, is the absolute best way. Great, thank you. She actually um, just confirmed that was the this, so <laughs> I'll do it right there. <laughs> um, we have another question. Um, as a small business owner, how do I know when I am ready to hire someone to do my books, and how do I know how much I should spend for this monthly service? So, uh, you know, this is a really interesting question, and I would always err on if you are not someone who enjoys keeping your books, it is now time to hire someone to keep them for you because you want to leverage your own talents in ways that are producing revenue for your company, not spending it on things that um, are probably taking you more time and, and definitely creating frustration for you. Um, you want to be doing the things that you enjoy and that are producing revenue. As far as how much to pay for this service, you know, that's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> but I will say that you want to make sure that you are valuing the service that you're being provided. So, you know, depends on the, the level of service you're looking for. If you're looking for someone to just take it off your plate and give you the information um, afterwards, then, you know, that's one level of service. If you're looking for um, just someone to kind of gather your information on a regular basis and work with you on the metrics that you're talking about, uh, that we were talking about earlier, that's a different level of service. So uh, I can't really put a dollar figure to it, it, but I want everyone to kind of have the mindset of this is important work and I'm placing value internally, value on it. Um, so that you can come to an agreement with your service provider on budget and the level of service that you need. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions, but um, we'll give it another minute. Um, oh, one question just popped up. Um, you talked about inventory, especially from restaurants who are now selling groceries instead of meals. How do you think this crisis will change businesses who, ha who do have an inventory? Um, well, I think it'll change it a, a couple of different ways. I think businesses will um, kind of change their supply chain structure. I, I foresee doing as many just-in-time uh, inventory models as possible. And so that for, for restaurants, that's going to mean uh, more frequent deliveries. It's going to mean uh, predicting the, the demand uh, more frequently. Uh, for other types of businesses, it may look like uh, shifting, you know, the, the, the distribution channels or the, the supply chain to different areas and different vendors in different countries. Uh, I think this is going to have a lasting change on the way people are investing in inventory and uh, even storing that inventory. 
Great, thank you. Um, we'll get them another minute. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, um, please type them in the chat option. Um, we can answer those um, before we end. Um, but if you miss any of this webinar, um, please visit events.bbcommunity.org or you can sign up for next week's webinars. We have them all scheduled um, every day of the week from Monday through Friday. Um, so please check out those. We have tons of topics, especially um, topics pertaining to the loans that are coming up. Um, some new loans just passed, I think, believe yesterday. Um, and then we'll have step-by-step -step processes and just tips on how to apply for those. Um, so please check those out. Um, let's see, we have a question from Jill. Um, do you believe that having your team work remotely improves your overall work satisfaction? Uh, absolutely. So it's really, really interesting um, to see people kind of embrace, employees embrace this work from home uh, standpoint. They are owning their workspaces, they are owning their schedule, they're even putting in more structure. And honestly, we have to make sure that our employees aren't overworking um, because it's really easy to just say, hey, you know, I'll, I'll complete this product, this project after dinner or whatever the case may be. Um, so from a work satisfaction standpoint, I absolutely believe that, that a remote work environment increases that work satisfaction um, as long as you can keep a connected team. Um, so we have a follow-up question from Kimberly. Um, again, from a nonprofit perspective, as we cancel in-person events for 2020, do you think sponsors would be open to repurposing their allocated sponsorship money in new ways? An example is we want to create a fund for small businesses. Mm, that's really, really interesting. You know, from a nonprofit perspective, we have seen things happen that I didn't think I would ever see happen. Uh, one of the main things is that as, as donors have been uh, granting or restricting donations for a purpose, they are taking their hands off and saying, you know what, we just want you guys to survive this. You use this um, as you see fit. I truly believe that if you have dollars already in your coffers that were sponsorships for events that are, have now been canceled, um, I know that we've done this for events that we have sponsored. We just let the the organization know, hey, you know, the whole purpose of us with these sponsorship dollars was, was just to support the work that you're doing. This was just the avenue that we chose to do it in. Uh, you know, go ahead and, and, and use this the best way you see fit. And it's just having that conversation, again, going back to communication, it's just having that conversation with those that have sponsored or contributed um, these dollars for these events. Okay, I think that's all the questions that we have here. Um, thank you so much, Jen, again, for taking time out of your busy day to present us with such useful information for our businesses. Um, please make sure you check out her website and her company to download those tools that she talked about. Um, they're definitely you know, something that we all need as business owners just to prepare for the next crisis when that happens. So thank you again, everyone, for attending. Um, please visit events.babycommunity.org and sign up for additional webinars. And thank you again, Jen. My pleasure. Thank you, guys.